Hello there, welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room once again. Today I'm going to be sewing a pencil skirt for all of you. I titled this video How to Make a Pencil Skirt or How to Sew a Pencil Skirt, something like that I'm sure will be the title, but really this is how I make a pencil skirt because I do it a little bit differently than perhaps other people would. I think I keep myself at a rather an intermediate level of sewing. I don't like to get into things that I consider fiddly like kick pleats or fully lining things often. Only if I have a very special fabric and feel very obligated to make a garment extra nice will I do those sort of things. Most of the time, especially for like a printed cotton sateen like we'll be using today, I just make a quick and dirty pencil skirt. It's gonna take me three or four hours and I can have a new skirt to wear that next day. So this is a, you know, more, I guess, intermediate towards, uh, leaning towards beginner method of making a pencil skirt, but maybe that'll be useful for those of you who are beginners and want to have something a little bit less intimidating to aim towards. Now, last week I did show how to draft a pencil skirt pattern from measurements or from scratch, um, kind of the final in my series of how to draft your own like sloper or fitting shell patterns that I've been doing here on the channel this year. Um, but of course you do not have to draft your own pencil skirt pattern. You can go ahead and buy a pencil skirt pattern. There are many out there. Most of the time they're very similar front, backs, darts, waistband, things like that. Um, some have a facing instead of a waistband. I prefer a waistband. I think it looks a little bit more vintage. And of course, all my pencil skirts I make very high-waisted or at the natural waist because I want that 1940s, 50s, 60s look, um, which is what I'll be going for again today. But before I ramble on any longer over here, let's just go ahead and get started and I'll show you how I make my pencil skirts. Beginning with fabric, of course. This is a yard of cotton sateen from moodfabrics.com. This video is not sponsored, but we all know I shop there quite a lot. I have this folded along uh, from salvage to salvage on the other side here. This is the fold side here. This does have a little bit of crosswise stretch. So of course I want that to go across my body. So this is folded along the length of the fabric. I'm gonna line up my center front of my center front piece here, or my front piece of my skirt, line up that center front along the fold here, because of course I want it to be identical on the other side. Luckily this print is uh, printed onto this fabric I can't tell if it's uh, like heat set onto the fabric or just digitally printed directly onto the fabric. It's very much a print that is on the surface of the fabric. That's the kind of the problem with digital print is that it's never very, like this black, for example, of the background of this is not very saturated. Um, darks and colors aren't always the most saturated when it comes to digital prints um, or heat transfer prints, but you get nice, crisp, cute little prints, but they're really much, very much on the surface of the fabric and it's white underneath. So that is an irritating thing about digital prints, but I just pinned that one on there along the center front. And of course I need to pin my back on as well, cause I'm gonna need to cut two of those. And I'm gonna pin this quite close here. So at least this one side seam isn't so out of whack, um, but I don't have enough fabric here. I only have one yard of this fabric. It is 54 or 55 inches wide, but I only have one yard of it. So I don't have enough to match the print, this large scale, like offset polka dot. I don't have enough to match the print along the side seams or the center back, sadly, because, you know, I didn't buy uh, a lot in order to do so. Um, if you buy a couple yards of fabric, you can go ahead and match up your print, of course, along the center back and along the side seams. But if you are frugal like me and just buy one yard of fabric, then you have less of a chance of being able to match your prints. Of course, the smaller the print, the easier it is to still match it up. But in this one, I really had no chance. So here I am just pinning this back piece. Again, you'll see the distance between the back of this pattern and the salvage is even all the way along because of course I need this to be straight on the straight grain with that stretch in the width. But I'm just pinning this along. I also have the like hems of these, uh, the skirt pieces here lined up so that um, the pattern is kind of like consistent across the hem of this. So it's not offset any further than it needs to be. Um, just by the nature of not being able to match with print. All right, so here these are. I'm gonna use this strip along here along the selvage for my waistband, this area here. So that is what I'm figuring out here, if that is where I want to put my waistband, and it is. I'm sorry if you hear things going on in the background, by the way, there are other people living in my house as usual, and they're making lots of noise upstairs, as is usual. Here are my fabric shears. I, I don't even know what brand they are. I've had them since college and they could use a sharpen. Oh my goodness. Um, but the fabric store I used to take them to, to get them sharpened at has since closed. And so now I don't know where to go locally to get my fabric shears sharpened, but alas, I will either need to find a place or buy a new set because these ones are very sad, but here I am just delicately cutting between the two pieces currently, but cutting these out. And uh, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge just how ridiculous my hair looks in these clips. 
My bangs are sticking out at all kinds of angles because I'm not thinking about my hair. I'm thinking about my sewing project. Um, and I don't get, again, I don't get glam to work from home very often, unless I have to be, of course, on camera. But I wasn't thinking about being on camera here. I was thinking about making a skirt, so that's unfortunate. I'm just cutting across the hems here. Um, this is a new top-down camera setup that I have for these last few videos. Let me know how you feel about that. Um, it kind of lets me keep working and keep my flow, which is really nice. Um, as, and it's much easier to get my footage because this is using my DSLR as opposed to using my cell phone, which is how I used to record pattern drafting and stuff over here on the blue table. But getting things off my iPhone onto my PC just became too much of a hassle and I had to just cut it out, honestly. So I'm going to be careful down here uh, where, next to the salvage because I want to save that salvage, like a long piece along the salvage to use for my waistband. So I'm being careful down there. I have a very small little amount of fabric in between the pieces here left over that I just need to cut off. So I'm being careful and cutting those few threads basically off the edge of this side seam on the back pieces here. The only trouble is with this new setup here, I do have to have my studio lights on. So it was quite warm here in the middle of the summer, making a skirt with lots of lights on me over here in the corner. And of course, now that you can see my arms so much, I'm sure I will get even more of those comments letting me know how I have hairy arms. Thank you. Yes. Of course, as everyone knows, all women must be completely hairless. Otherwise, they don't count as female. Um, or, or that might just be society. Uh, so I don't tend to care. So I have this piece along the selvage left over that I can go ahead and use as my waistband for this skirt. I'm just going to go ahead and cut that down to a better size. Um, of course, there's less stretch this lengthwise way than there is crosswise. So I'm going to use that uh, more stable part of the fabric to my advantage, and it will help the waistband retain stability, I suppose. I'm just going to cross off this end here so I have a nice straight line. Go ahead and slice that off. All right, and I'm just going to come up about like, I guess, I don't know, an inch from the selvage here. So I'm going to go ahead and this is probably going to be, I don't know, three and a half inches wide. I don't really even bother to measure here. You can see how particular I am about these things. Not so much, but I'm just coming up again, uh, an inch of the print above the salvage. So about an inch and a half up plus the two inches. So yeah, three and a half inch wide waistband here. And I'm just going to make it um, like 36 inches long and slice off the other end that you can't see. Of course, it's off camera here, but I just have this straightened off piece of fabric. I will cut off the other side here as well. And then I will just keep this strip for when it's time to turn it into a waistband, I suppose. But I just cut little strips of fabric from along the lengthwise um, bits of my fabric here. I see no reason to have a waistband pattern when it's just a long straight strip of fabric. All right, so this will be my waistband eventually, but I can set it aside for now. All right, let's, let's grab the backs of the skirts here. I'm gonna go ahead and mark the darts on everything because of course I have many a dart to sew now. So I'm gonna take this pattern piece off of there, unpin everything, find some tailor's chalk over here. Oop, pencils are flying. So I have some triangles of trailer, tailor's chalk sitting around and also some Prismacolor uh, colored pencils, which is what I prefer to use when marking my fabric, even though it's not like erasable or disappearing or anything. But I always say, if there's marks on the inside of your project, who will ever know but you? So there are holes punched in my pattern with an awl here. Here's what an awl looks like. Um, and I just use that to punch my dart points and uh, legs in through my pattern so that I can use those punch marks to transfer my darts over, which you will see in just a moment. But here's the center back of my skirt. As you can see, the pattern does not match up along the center back. Again, like I said, I didn't have enough fabric to think about that much, so I just didn't bother, and it won't bother me, but I bet you it'll bother several of you. Um, because some people are more, even more perfectionists than I am, which is saying something, because I can be quite harsh. Um, so I'm just going to put my pattern back down on top of this piece. Make sure I have it lined up as perfectly as I can, funny enough. And then I will go ahead and use this colored pencil through those holes parked in the poked through the pattern. Bleh, I can speak. And I will just mark those dart legs and the dart points on to my fabric here. Um, you probably can't see them, especially with all this fuzz in the way on camera, but I do promise you that they are there. And on the other side, just the same just transferring those points onto the back of my fabric here. Then I can use my ruler and this little piece of trailer, tailor's chalk here 
to go ahead and connect those lines as a guide for sewing these darts. Just do that the same for all of these. If you see the paint that is stained on this table, like the little white dots above my ruler and stuff right here, that's actually from painting the tool for the first version of uh, the galaxy skirt I made. If you haven't seen my galaxy skirt from my Star Wars vintage lookbook, I will put a card up to the galaxy skirt video here. But uh, I made an original, the first version of a galaxy skirt I ever made, I actually painted the tool and it obviously went through the very loose weave tool onto my table and I just never have cleaned it. And that was literally in 2016. So the paint is here to stay. Here I am just pinching and pinning my darts. If you've ever seen me do darts here on the channel, you know how I kind of just pinch my fabric, but I do want to make sure everything is aligned as best I can, especially because I'm showing all of you and trying to be a good demonstrator today. Um, so I'm just pinching and pinning those darts, making sure everything is lined up on the other side flipping and flipping back and and pinching the darts like so throwing pins everywhere and then I will go ahead and pin each dart again making sure everything's lined up on the front and back while I'm doing this I am pinning these uh, in this direction or like folded to the with a fold to the right that way I can sew from the top of the dart down when I get over to the machine of course and here is the front piece as well. Of course, I will do the same for the front. I'm going to go ahead and lay out the piece and then transfer the darts onto the back of the front as well here. So here is our skirt front. Sateen wants to stick to itself and all the fuzz wants to stick to it. Lovely. You can see what I mean about the digital print being white. It's very the fabric is actually very white uh, and then the print is just on the other surface and as soon as you like start to move the threads apart at all you can see that the fabric is actually white underneath which is just the saturation of digital prints and I think this might be a heat press print um, but either way the difference is by the way uh, digital prints can be done in two different ways as far as I know um, I've seen one done I've actually I think I've seen both done live because they had a digital printing machine up at uh, Colorado State University which is where I had I got my apparel design degree, but um, you can either print directly onto the roll of fabric from like an inkjet printer that prints onto the fabric itself, or it, you can have a uh, like thermo pro process where it's like a heat set print. So the print gets printed onto a piece of paper in reverse, and then that piece of paper is rolled or laid on top of the fabric. That is then run through a heat press, and then the print transfers. It's a heat transfer onto the fabric. Um, and I think this one might be a heat transfer just because it's such a th like a small layer of print. Uh, the saturation on this is so low that I think that it it probably didn't even run through an inkjet. Um, it would have more dye than this even if it did that. So I think it is a heat transfer print on here. Anyway, just marked those front darts and now I shall pin them just the same. Um, I actually worked at a company that did heat transfer printing on the garments that we sewed back when I was a manager of a sewing room for a little while. Pinning all of these darts. I'm going to leave uh, some of this video in real time if I can, just to give you an idea of how long these sort of things take me as well. Um, you can see here I keep pinning and repinning this, trying to get it perfect, especially because I'm trying to do this nicely for all of you today. And I was even, I even had a dream about um, taking all my pins out as I sew, because we, if you've been here before, <laughs> you know. I sew over my pins quite a lot, but when I'm trying to be really good and demonstrate things, I try and take them out, but I do give it up, but we'll get to that later. Again, just appreciate that bit of my bangs. Can we, can we all just, wow, what, what a dreamy look. This is what I get for having very short bangs and for trimming them myself, honestly. All right, now we are over at the machine finally, and I can sew my darts. Again, I'm starting at the top of the wedge of the dart here. A little bit of back stitching up there. I do have this turned down to quite a small stitch length. I'm going to sew along the um, chalk marking here and then at the very like last half an inch I try and almost curve the dart a little bit and then sew right off the edge. Um, you just want to sew as close to possible uh, over the fold for the end of the dart so that this tapers as much as you can and even if you curve it just a little bit here it actually helps. And then here I'm using a spare pin to pull the threads apart that way I can go ahead and tie the end of the dart here. Um, this I just think gives a nicer finish and is less likely to pucker. You're not going to pull hard on this. You see how I am pulling quite gently the knot down to the surface. And I'm just going to tie that, I think it's four times normally kind of what I do. Um, 
two would suffice, I think. And then I will go ahead and use the thread trimmer on the side of my machine to trim this down to about a one inch tail. And I will just leave that inside my garment where it will hurt no one. And I can trim the tail at the top there too. So that's how I sew my darts. Again, I do try and use a smaller stitch length and then sew right off the edge of the bottom, trying to make that taper as much as possible so that I don't get puckers at the ends of my darts. And depending on the fabric, sometimes that's almost unavoidable, to be fair. Um, I was using a thick cotton eyelet here on the channel recently, and there was just no way I could taper my darts properly because that fabric was so strange with the thick bits of thread in that eyelet pattern that there was no way. But here I am going to go ahead and sew the rest of my darts on the other back piece, and of course the four darts on the front, all in the same method, starting at the top, sewing down the chalk line, trying to curve the ends just a little bit as I sew off the edge and then tying the ends of the darts shut. Over here on the pressing table and or ironing board and or wow, you need to get a new cover for your ironing board, it's so stained. Yes, I know, it's very true. I'm gonna go ahead and press these darts over a tailor's ham. This is a little sort of sawdust, I think is what's inside, stuffed pillow. So it has some give to it, but not a bunch. Um, but it's always nice to press things that are supposed to be over a curved part of the body or are a curved seam on a curved surface. So pressing it on a tailor's ham actually helps give a very smooth finish. And here's what my darts look like on the outside. You can see I don't have any of those weird telltale puckers at the end of these darts. So I have my taking time with them has worked out for me and pressing them on for that curve is always helpful as well. And then I'm going to go ahead and uh, serge the raw edges of my pieces. Now I'm not going to serge the hem because it's going to be turned up twice anyway, so I'm not going to bother, but otherwise I will serge the raw edges, including across the top, even though that too will be encased. I just like to have that extra bit of structure up there. And now I can go ahead and line up my side seams to sew those. So I'm going to lay one of the back pieces on top of one of the front sides here. Um, of course, there's only one front piece. It's only, you know, four pieces counting the waistband for this entire project. You just have your one front piece, your two back pieces here. But I'm just lining up the back on top of the front and I will go ahead and pin along this. Um, again, I use a lot of pins in my sewing. Some people use clips, some people don't use pins at all. Um, but you know, each to their own, as I always say here on this channel. I'll sew my way, you sew your way. We'll all have cute clothes, hopefully at the end of the thing, you know? Um, try to enjoy the process as much as possible and so I hence why I also don't do fiddly things and time-consuming projects because again I I enjoy sewing but I don't love sewing I love having I love designing and wearing clothes but I don't necessarily love the making process uh, the same way that I love the other bits it's sort of a means to an end for me so here I am sewing and you see I was taking those pins out to show you what you should do but now I'm gonna go ahead and sew over the pins because that is what I I really do. Again, I have a smallish stitch length here. I don't ever use a really large stitch length unless I'm doing gathering or basting. Um, I'm helping this through the machine because this machine, he, he's seen better days. It's its time to be retired. Um, it's very, it hasn't been serviced in ages. It probably needs a really deep clean, but uh, in the process of wanting to get a new machine, we went into lockdown, so that didn't happen. And I have an email. All right, so just back stitching at the beginning and at the end of that seam, of course. And back over on the pressing table, I can go ahead and press that side seam. Put that tailor's ham under the curved portion at the top here again, where there is a curve. I like to use the tailor's ham. Again, you can buy one of these online or at most fabric shops. I should think they will have pressing tools, especially a very ubiquitous one like a tailor's ham like this. So I'm just pressing over that. And again, I don't have a clapper, so I just use my hand. And yes, I do burn myself sometimes. But who needs skin? It's fine. And then I will press the rest of the seam open here as well, nice and flat and smooth. And then that serging, of course, will protect my raw edges in here. You could, of course, use something else. If you don't have a serger, you can use a um, different type of seam. You could do a um, French seam on something like this, or you could use bias binding along the edges or seam binding. I do actually have a video about different seam finishes, so I'll put a card up to that here now. And here I'm just lamenting that my side seam, of course, the pattern does not match up, but what are you gonna do? Buy more fabric, honestly, if you're a real professional, but I am not. So I'll just press the other side that same way, pressing this flat bit of it 
flat and then the curved top uh, over the hips area kind of side over the tailor's ham. Honestly, I do use so much mood fabric. You would think that I, and like you can see mood bag underneath, <laughs> right where I just put that tailor's ham. You would think I am sponsored by them, but no. But if, you know, mood, if you want to hit me up and start providing the fabric, I'm here for you, babe. Them's the facts. So now I am with my side seams sewn and pressed. I'm lining up the center back here and I'm going to sew this uh, in my own unique special way because of how I do my zippers. And we're gonna do my zipper in detail today because sometimes I skip that in my projects here because it's the same every time. But uh, I'm gonna show you how I do my zippers here today. So I have this zipper lined up and about a quarter inch up from the end of where the zipper is, I'm going to put two pins close together. And that is how I know how long I need to baste. So from here up, from the two pink pins here up to the top where I'm gonna start pinning now, in between these areas, I'm going to sew this back seam, same seam allowance as the rest of it, one inch seam allowance along the back of my pencil skirt for my pattern, just what I've added. Um, I'm gonna sew this with a large basting stitch length. And then from below those two pink pins, I'm going to sew with a normal small stitch length. And that is gonna be my real back seam. And then from those two pins up to the waist, I will take that basting out after I have pressed the seam open. And then I will have this nice finished edge to work with for putting in a lap zipper. So from here up, I'm gonna baste. And from here down, I'm gonna sew the seam normally with back stitching and all that jazz. Um, I have gone ahead and pinned the whole thing. And then I realized, oh, of course I'm leaving this last bit open for a slit down here. So again, I'm gonna leave a space there as well. But up here, we're gonna have the zipper. Then in the center, we have regular stitching. And then down here at the bottom, it's going to be open to have a little slit in the back to help with movement. And I'll put a double pin here too. Um, usually I put double pins where I need to cause attention to myself. So down here at the bottom of the skirt where the slit will be, I'm putting in a couple of rows of back stitching and moving the machine a little bit around so that I get this little like, uh, almost like, I don't know, extra hold down here. Because of course, if you walk too quickly, you can easily pull and rip your skirt back there. Um, sometimes people put extra, I don't know, tape in there or secure, extra security um, in the end of a slit like that. But this is a stretchy fabric and I don't have a tapered pencil skirt. I have a straight cut pencil skirt. So I'm not worried about tearing this. I'm not often going anywhere in a hurry, honestly. So I've sewn from those two double pins up to the other two double pins up here and just did some more back stitching up here. This is where my zipper will end eventually. Then I'm just gonna put it right back under the machine. Same seam allowance back here, still one inch seam allowance, but I've changed the stitch length to the largest size. So I'm basting from there on up and up to the waist. I will just put in same line of stitching, but with larger stitches because I will be taking them out. So you can see here this little extra nodule of thread I put at the bottom there to help hold my slit closed. Now I'm gonna slide my skirt on over my ironing board here, walk around the camera. This, this involves a lot of walking around the camera um, and just move that out of the way so that I can go ahead and press that seam I just sewed in that several step process open. So it's pressing my center back seam open here. Again, I couldn't match my pattern along the center back because I didn't have enough fabric. So it's gonna be weird. Oh my goodness, we just had a very big firework outside. Goodness knows why people are still exploding things in their backyard right next to me. Um, well, hopefully that was a firework. Maybe, maybe it wasn't. In America, you can never really quite be sure. All right, so here I am down here at the slit. I am just going to go ahead and press that with the same sort of seam allowance as the rest, even though that will be left open. And I'll just put a couple of stitches in later to hold that, but you will see that when I get to it. Up here at the top near the waist, I'm gonna go ahead and take the basting stitches out now because I've Got this pressed open so the, the pressing holds it nice and uh, the edges right where I want them. And so now I no longer need this basting stitching. That's why I did it with a large loose stitch length up here. So I'm gonna pull it all right back out. Now that I have that stitching out and that area is open, basically I have a slit uh, for the, at the bottom of the skirt for walking and I have one up at the top for zipper right now. But you can see I have these nice finished folded pressed edges now to put my zipper in here. Um, so, I take this sort of right hand side and that's going to be the side that will be hidden underneath the lapped part of my zipper. So it's going to be put uh, lined up right next to the zipper teeth. So I'm going to line up the tape with the top of the skirt here and just pin this folded edge on top of my zipper right along the teeth. And these pins I do remove as I go so I can just put them right in the way. 
in the line of fire, as it were. But I'm just going to go ahead and pin that nice pressed folded edge right along the zipper teeth here, and then I will sew it in place. Now, some people may switch to a zipper foot for this kind of thing, um, but I don't. I have a zipper foot. Uh, I could, and in the past I have. But again, as I've said many a time here on the channel, I'm a lazy seamstress. And even changing the presser foot, I'm not going to stop to do it. So I use my regular presser foot to do this, and I will show you how. I'm going to slide in the skirt here underneath the machine, and I'm just going to... This is from the bottom to the bottom of the zipper here. Of course, I only have that single layer underneath the machine here. And I just line this up so that my thread is going to go just along where I put those pins, really. Very close to the zipper... Uh, teeth and very close to the... Was I saying zipper feet earlier? Zipper teeth? Oh goodness, I was hope, hope I was saying zipper teeth. I'm going to have to re-record this. Anyway, close along the zipper teeth here into the fabric, just catching that folded edge and sewing it down to the zipper tape underneath. So I'm just using my regular presser foot for this. I'm sitting that presser foot on top of the zipper, really, but I'm just looking through that little window in the, in the presser foot to see where those zipper teeth are and sewing, you know, probably an eighth of an inch into the fold of fabric, or the edge, really. Now when I get close to the end, of course, there's going to be the zipper pull itself in my way. So I'm going to leave the needle down, lift up the presser foot, and unzip the zipper, and press the zipper, um, like, pull out of my way, although it was trying to get stuck this time, and I was like, come on! Um, there we go. So now the zipper pull is on the other side. I can keep holding that folded edge close to the zipper teeth, even though it is open now, and sew the rest of it up to the top. A little bit of back stitching up there, and that side is on. Slide that back off the machine, and now I can lay that on the pressing table again. So we have one side down. Now a lapped zipper is lapped over. That's why it's called that. Um, so we're just going to use this edge to close over that stitching we just put in, basically. Line it up, that folded edge of the other side, over the stitching we just put in, and I'm just going to pin that down with these very fine um, glass-headed pins that are usually used for finer fabrics, but I like them because they're uh, so fine that I can, again, leave them in while I sew. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, for all you people who hate me sewing over my pins, this video is torture, but I am going to sew over these pins in a minute as well, but you will see how. So I'm just pinning my lapped zipper closed. You can see these little white marks along the fold from where that stitching was. This is not usually a problem. Again, this digital print fabric, the print is very fragile. So um, my method doesn't work so great with this dark digital print, but usually it's fine. If you have a fabric that's the same color all the way through and that doesn't have a white back, you would never have this problem. But of course, with the digital print, it's very sensitive and it didn't like being sewn and then having thread taken out of it. Um, it's kind of, you get, it's a fabric where you get like one shot at it if you want it to be pristine. Anyway, back onto the machine, the same direction. I'm going to put my, again, same zipper foot down. And I have that side zipper foot, same presser foot down. Shoot, it's the regular presser foot, sorry. Um, and I have that lined up and held up against the edge of the zipper teeth underneath the fabric there. So that is just, the presser foot is pressed up against the edge of the zipper teeth underneath the fold here. And that is, I'm using as my guide and sewing all along the zipper up to the top. And again, sewing over those pins. I've never had any trouble with this. If I had a lot of problems with it, I wouldn't do it because, again, I'm lazy. So if it caused me issues, I wouldn't do it. Once you get up to the top again, we're going to have that zipper pull in the way again. So I'm going to take some of these pins out, leave my needle down again, raise the presser foot, move the zipper pull out of my way, as usual, just like last time. Hold that back down where it needs to be, like so. And I can still use that zipper teeth underneath there as a guide against my presser foot as I sew up the rest of the the zipper tape here. And then of course back stitching to hold in place. All right, the zipper is all in. Again, you can see that the thread marked this fabric. Again, normally this is so not a problem. It's just this digital print being a pain. Um, any roller print would never betray me like that. Um, all right, here's my waistband piece. What I have done here is I've marked the center of that. So that's where I'm pinching it now. And then over on the ends from the center, I marked 15 and a half inches on one side, 15 and a half inches on the other side, so that I can have a 31 inch waist here. I will go ahead and find the center of my skirt as well, because I didn't bother to mark it. Oops. So here's the center front of my skirt. I'll just put a pin there so that I can then line that up with the center front of the waistband that I just marked. 
And you can see I just cut this along the selvage and I'm just going to use it along the selvage. And instead of putting a twill tape in, I'm basically using the selvage, which is a bit stronger. So, or usually in my experience. So now I have pinned the center of the waistband to the center of the skirt. And I'm just going to go ahead and pin the waistband onto the skirt all along. I go about halfway and then I'll mark the end here. So I'm going to go ahead and pin the end where that marking, marking 15 and a half inches is and then make sure everything's lining up. It should be because, you know, my pencil skirt hypothetically fits me, um, and it does. I'm going to pin open the seam allowance as I go here, and make sure your darts are facing the right direction if, like me, you haven't surged over them, which does tend to help them stay where they need to be. But then I will just go ahead and pin all along the top of the waistband here. Same with the other side, just lining up that mark with the other end here, and just pinning that into place and I'm just going to leave these like extra tails on the end of my waistband for now. I don't need to care about them yet so I'm just going to leave them there. It doesn't matter if they're chilling at the end. Again just making this fit properly. This side wanted to not <laughs> play with me very well but we got there in the end. All right everything pinned on we can go back over to the machine and go ahead and sew this on. Now, because this was the last thing I had to sew by machine for this project, uh, the light on my machine decided to die. For a second there, I thought my machine had finally died, and man was I bummed. But no, it was just the light bulb and the machine had died out, so forgive me. We have a little bit less of a bright glow going on this time, because the machine, somehow sensing this was the last seam of my project, the light went out. So, so here I am sewing the waistband onto my skirt, same half-inch seam allowance, same small stitch length, as usual, again, backstitching at the beginning and backstitching at the end, just sewing that right on to the edge. Um, and, you know, sadly with no light. And now I have to figure out how to get into this machine and change the light bulb because I haven't done it for many years, naturally, and that is why it has gone out on me. Okay, waistband now on. I can take my pins out, of course. Now, some people put a stay tape or like a waist tape inside of their skirts, too. Again, this is just a simple cotton sateen pencil skirt, so I don't, I don't bother. All right, time to finish the waistband off. So I'm going to go ahead and give this a quick little press here. Just pressing that uh, up, I guess. <laughs> and smooth. Then I'm going to go ahead and pr press this edge over. Press that salvage edge over, basically. That half inch here. Like so. Then over here I can go ahead and trim this off, so I'm going to give myself a half inch here to fold over and go ahead and trim that waistband down. Then I can fold this over the edge and again press that. Give it a little steam, try and do some convincing here, even though it wasn't quite having it. And then I can fold that down and I'll have a nice finished edge in the end, inside, outside, etc. Go ahead and pin that in place and along here. And I will actually hand sew this down along the inside. You can stitch in the ditch, as this is called. You can put this back in the machine and stitch uh, right like where the seam is on the other side and catch this edge by machine, but I just prefer to do it by hand. Again, this is one of those things where like, weirdly, I'm not lazy. <laughs> like I have so many shortcuts that I do in my sewing and then every once in a while they'll be like, oh, and then I do this by hand. And I, I don't have to. I don't like stitching in the ditch, so uh, I prefer to just catch this by hand, which I will show you momentarily after I have it all pinned down like so. As you can probably tell watching my sewing videos, if you've been here before, or even just watching this video, if this is your first video of mine, I'm sorry. Um, I don't think you have to be a perfect, flawless seamstress to make your own clothes. And that's kind of this, one of the things I want to impart here on my channel. You know, you don't have to be a couturier a professional tailor to make your own clothes. You're going to get better with experience and time. Um, and you're going to be eventually become like me where you know how to do it nicer and you may end up skipping steps and feeling more comfortable as well. So I really, for people who are afraid and intimidated by starting sewing, I would rather, you know, people start somewhere and do things, you know, a little slapdash at the beginning and then improve their skills as they go along and learn more as they go along and then decide what to implement where and, you know, that's how your process and your sewing becomes personal to you. Just like everyone has their own personal style, everyone has their own personal sewing style um, as well. Back when more people were makers, it was, you know, probably more 
divergence in this uh, and more similarities in some ways, but because now so few people make their own clothes, um, but there's still a lot of resources to go to, but like you, you don't have to do everything perfectly, especially at the start. And I, I would, I hope people can be less intimidated by things like that sound very scary, like pattern drafting and learning to sew. Um, you, you can do it. I, I believe in all of you. I believe everyone can learn to sew. Here I'm just hand stitching the end of my waistband shut here. This is the right hand side. If you're looking at the back of the skirt, it's the right hand side of my zipper here. So it's just folded right to the edge. And I'm just, as you can see, like whip stitching that shut in black like this with black thread. No one will ever see it. Again, who is this close to your end of your waistband? You can slip stitch this if you want. Sometimes I do. In fact, on the other side of this skirt, I think I slip stitch it. So, you know, when it comes to hand stitching, I just kind of do what feels right in the moment. I let the force guide me in these things. Um, but here I am just whip stitching this shut. I actually picked up a USB on my way with that last stitch out of the way, honestly. Um, so I'm just stitching that all shut to my liking, basically. Like so. All right, and now I can start again. I'm gonna whip stitch just the very edge of this down to the zipper tape in here as well. And then I will go ahead and stitch, uh, slip stitch along the fold in that waistband to uh, just above the stitching on the skirt. So it will be invisible from the outside. You won't have any stitches on the outside. It's just being sewn into, cause like the seam allowance from the skirt, you know, is pressed up into under that waistband. And so you're sewing the fold of the waistband edge to the seam allowance from sewing it on. Honestly, you can see I'm just taking a little bit of the waistband fold and then a little bit of the just above the stitching line fabric basically hopefully you can see that I will try and zoom in as well and then of course that means it's invisible on the other side which we always like a clean finish don't we so up into that folded edge about I don't know a centimeter like so and then down into the seam allowance right above that stitching and another bite of this and another bite of the skirt etc etc go along make sure you're not pulling too tight and make sure you're not leaving it too loose honestly I kind of tend to pull it tight and then pull back a little bit of the tension um, you just don't want this to be too tight or you'll snap it when you try and put on the skirt um, but of course you don't want it to be too loose either but just go along the whole waistband like so and how I finished on the other side again, I kind of just folded everything down. I left a little bit of a overhang on this side because this is the side of the zipper that is lapped as well. And I will be putting a skirt hook on to finish the top of this waistband. So I want a little bit of space to do that. So again, I'm kind of just whip stitching the like four layers of fabric here because it's like folded and then folded on itself. Closed. But again, it comes out quite invisible, honestly. And yes, I do stab myself with a needle sometimes. Also, some people have expressed alarm that I don't use a thimble, and I don't. Um, I have one sitting here, actually, for very stubborn moments, but normally I don't use a thimble, no. I don't do a ton of hand sewing, though. I usually only do, like, my hems and waistbands like this. I don't, you know, hand sew that much. If I was doing long seams with it, I can understand how having a thimble would be indispensable. But I'm usually just doing small finishing, so it's... Not too much trouble for me. I do end up whip stitching this whole thing. See, I thought for a second I might have slip stitched it, but even though I'm trying to be good for this video, I still am cutting a corner. But again, if anyone's ever looking at my waistband that closely, then, I mean, you're already lucky, aren't you? And you shouldn't be bothering me about anything else. <clears throat> or either that or you're my dry cleaner. <laughs> Maybe my dry cleaner judges me. But I will never know. All right, just feeding my needle back through here after I finish that corner, and then I'm going to tie this off here and then get a new piece of thread to sew on a uh, skirt hook. And I have another piece of thread here. Just knotted that, a doubled. I always use doubled thread, really, um, unless I'm doing something super fine also. Um, I'm just going to sew the hook to this side where the lap side of the zipper is. I'm just coming up from underneath here. And I will just go through all the way to the other side. Again, you can sew this invisibly if you want. But again, 
who is looking at the center back of your waistband that closely that they're going to be like, oh my god, do you have a line of stitching? Disgusting. Um, so again, I don't care. <laughs> this is again, is a pencil skirt I make, I can make a skirt like this in again, like an evening. So it's not a long term painstaking process. It's a I get to wear this tomorrow process. You know what I mean? So I'm just going to sew the hook onto this side and the bar onto the other side. Of course, I will zip up the zipper to find out exactly where each need to be to line up perfectly. But just sew those on and then all that will be left for this skirt is to go ahead and press and stitch the hem. So back here over on the pressing table again, I'm going to go ahead and press down about a half inch all along the hem here. I don't measure it. I bought, I uh, eyeball it, which is the moral of the story quite often here for me. But I'm just going to go ahead and press up a half inch all the way along the hem here. And then when I get to the other side, I'm going to go ahead and decide how deep I want my hem to be. It's about an inch, maybe an inch and an eighth this time. And then I kind of decided how I want to do the corner down here by the slit. I couldn't decide if I wanted to like miter the corner and make it super nice for you. But then I decided this is showing how I make pencil skirts and I don't do that. So we're not going to do it today either. <laughs> we're just going to do it how I normally do. Which is not like this because I think that the stitching shows too much. So I like to do it folded along the slit side edge. Wow, that's not easy to say. I slit the sheet. The, the sheet I slit. And on the slitted sheet I sit from my high school theater days when we used to do tongue twisters. That one's a fun one for you. Go ahead and give it a try and you can see what kind of mistakes will happen. I slit the sheet. The sheet I slit. And on the slitted sheet I sit. You can understand what kind of mistakes can easily happen there. All right, so I have this folded up that one inch now at the back and I can go all the way along here and press. Again, I'm using those glass headed pins so I can iron right over them with no fear. But I'm just folding that up again, about an inch, maybe a little over an inch. Again, I'm just eyeballing this. You can use a hem gauge if you would like. You can use a ruler if you would like. However, I just use my eyeballs because how many skirts have I hemmed in my days? A lot, a great many skirts. And so I, alas, will just do it by eye. Again, if I'm using a more expensive fabric, if I'm doing a like uh, more intensive project, then I will be more patient and calm about this sort of thing. But in this case, with a cheap cotton sateen, I'm not going to bother, you know? I'm just not going to bother. All right, we've reached the other side here. And I'm just pinning the last bits in place and I can go ahead and go sit back down at my computer desk to hand stitch the shut. Now I'm going to put a little, uh, you can see I'm leaving long stitches on the back side and then taking tiny little bites out of the fabric. So only very small stitches will show on the outside here. Just stitching that uh, like seam allowance down along the back opening here. I'm tired of saying the word slit, sorry. <laughs> All right, and until I reach this back edge here, and then here is finally where I do a bit of slip stitching because I do want it to look nice. I don't know why I think that someone will be looking closer at the bottom of my skirt here than they would at the waistband, but clearly somewhere in my subconscious has decided that. Um, so I'm going to come up here and stitch the edge of the hem down to the seam allowance, first of all. I'm just kind of whip stitching that down. Again, if you've been here before, you know I don't actually really think about the names or styles of hand stitching. I kind of just intuitively do things and then figure that they must have an official name. Now I'm going to take a little bit from this side and a little bit from this side. So we're going to slip stitch this shut like you would a pillowcase. And uh, after you put the pillow in it, you know, what well, most people's first pro sewing project is probably a pillowcase because of course you just have to sew a square and then slip stitch the last side shut once you have stuffed the square full of pillow stuff. But um, here I am slip stitching this little edge shut. And then when I get to the corner, I will feed the needle back through in between the layers of fabric. So I'll feed that needle back down to where I need it to be. Again, don't pull too hard because you don't want the weird tension things to happen to that corner. Nice and crisp, nice and finished. Perfecto. Well, not perfecto, but close enough. All right, so now I can go ahead and feed the needle through the folded edge. Oh, actually, I'm going to tie it off here, I guess. I decided to add a knot just for 
In case my hem ever comes undone, then the, this edge will not. That's nice of me. All right, now I'm going to come up into the folded edge of the hem, just like we were doing actually for the waistband, basically. Only now we're taking a tiny bite out of the fabric. And again, when doing this, you would not want to pull too hard. You don't want too much tension up in here. Um, and I'm sorry I'm about to sew right off the edge of the camera. Clearly I'm looking at what I'm doing and not the frame. So, ah, yes, here we go. I've noticed, look at me. Um, so again, taking a tiny bite out of the fabric and then into that folded edge up here, tiny bite out of the fabric, Whoop, lost my thread, and then into the folded edge. I'm just gonna do this all the way along until I get to the other side. I'll finish the other side just the same way as I did the first. And of course we can see virtually nothing on the outside of the fabric, just what we want. So I'm just gonna keep going along the very same way. And then this skirt will be all finished and uh, I can go ahead and figure out what to wear with it, honestly. I just bought this because I love the print, but it's hard to match things with this sort of faded black background. It's like almost gray and not black. So here it is with a black top and it just doesn't even really go, but that's all right. I'll figure out what to wear with this later. And here is my finished skirt on me being worn. Again, is the fit of my pattern absolute pristine perfection? Probably not, but it works for me. And that's all I really require, honestly. Um, I think you can spend forever fixing your patterns and fixing the fit on things. But for me, at some point, I just kind of have to like call it and move on and start using my patterns because I'm more interested in having the clothes than perfecting fit, unfortunately. Hence, again, why I will never be a couturier or a grand tailor. I just, I'm just a home seamstress who likes to have cute retro clothes. So I just do whatever level I need to, to get, to achieve that goal, honestly. But I hope you enjoyed seeing how I put together a pencil skirt here in my sewing room. If you ever have any suggestions for me on things you'd like to see me make or want to know how I do them or how I pattern draft things, leave those for me in the comments below as usual. And of course, I will see you back here again in my sewing room and with more vintage fashion real soon. Bye.